Okay, now we can get started. So I gave most of this talk last year, um, but I know a bunch of people missed it, uh, so I, there was some interest in, interest in giving it again. Um, Crash Python is a, a kernel debugger that I've been working on that's written using uh, GDB's Python extensions. Um, and it's getting to be pretty useful, so I'll start from the top. Oop. Okay, so the original crash was started over 20 years ago, and, or I guess it's about 20 years ago now, uh, and supported just generic crash dumping. It was originally by SGI and Mission Critical Linux, but didn't get super useful until uh, 2004 with disk and net dumping added by Red Hat. Um, internally, it, it's all written in C, and it links directly with GDB. It patches GDB and then links directly with it, um, using GDB almost as a library rather than uh, a debugger itself. Um, anybody who's used Crash knows it works pretty well, but it has some pretty big limitations. Um, as a semantic debugger, it needs constant updating with each kernel release. So if you ever uh, are debugging like a, the latest upstream kernel and you have a crash dump, then suddenly you sometimes can't use it. Um, that takes time to, to evolve, uh, but you know it's the nature of the beast. It always needs to be able to understand the, the data structures. Um, it has a powerful command set, but it's fairly limited in what it can do. So, you know, you can do list iterations, you can do uh, structure examinations, but you can't actually do any filtering. You can't do any uh, nested work. So say you want to list all the super blocks, but you only want to list ones from XFS. You can't do that. Um, you say you want to go and examine a couple data structures deep, um, keyed off of each one of those. You can't do that, unless you're going to do text processing out of band, and it just gets painful really fast. Um, it's also not cross-architecture, so if you want to have an S390 dump, you need to run Crash on an S390. So GDB. Uh, starting with version 7, GDB embedded a Python interpreter. Uh, there, it's fairly limited in what it can do. Uh, mostly it's used for implementing uh, pretty printing for uh, various types on demand. <laughs> um, it can be used to directly execute GDB commands. Um, but it can also look up types, it can look up symbols, it can uh, do a lot of the things you can do from the GDB command line uh, programmatically, which makes it pretty powerful. Um, but in the mainline GDB, it's incomplete for our purposes. Um, it, it's missing support for minimal symbols, which are, uh, at least in, in symbol table terms, are the ones that you get when you say have a, uh, a linker table name uh, or uh, a symbol declared in an assembly file, things that don't have types. They're just a name that, that points to a position. Uh, we don't have section names in Python, um, which I don't know if we actually need anymore, um, but it was useful for doing per CPUs uh, when I first started this. Um, it doesn't look up static symbols directly um, because it doesn't accept a, a null block, I think. I it's, it's a bug I fixed a while ago. Uh, it doesn't do register caches, which are needed for uh, populating tasks. It can't actually add new threads, so uh, that's pretty limiting for a kernel debugger to not be able to teach GDB about tasks. Um, it does support ELF and debug infos directly, um, but it doesn't support KDump, because KDump is just an, uh, effectively an arbitrary format that isn't ELF, it's not a, a real core dump. It can dump an ELF, but most people don't. Uh, so the solution for that is to link uh, to, well, to, to create a Python target so that you can add arbitrary targets to, to GDB without patching it. Um, initially, this was got, uh, done by Kieran Bingham, and I think he's at Lunaro, I forget where. Um, and his use case was mostly for interfacing with arbitrary ARM boards and things like that so that uh, he could debug ARM stuff. Uh, but for our purposes, it's actually pretty solid once extended a little bit. Um, and we use this to do it. Uh, libkdump file and libadder xlate uh, are libraries written by uh, Petr Teshizik, who, uh, as far as I know, was writing them to uh, make it easier to write tools outside of make dump file and things like that. Um, and a few years ago, I said, hey, you know, you have these, these really useful libraries. Is it possible to give me a Python interface for them? And he was super accommodating and did exactly that. Uh, and that was like a hack week, maybe two, three years ago. Um, so now we have 
a Python libkdump file and we have this Python GDB target, we can link them together. It's super easy. It's about 100 lines of code. And now GDP, GDB understands how to read kdump files. So you can go in and you can examine structure values. You can uh, read things out of the dump file just like you would out of an ELF file. Um, so we're getting to doing actual symbolic debugging, but it doesn't have a lot of the things that you really need to be useful, like tasks. So that's where Crash Python comes in. So far, all we've done is the infrastructure work. Um, we have a, a baseline debugger that doesn't do anything semantically with, with well, the kernel at all. And uh, so the Crash Python project is the, the stuff on top of that, which actually interprets the kernel crash dump in a semantic way. Um, so now that we can read the kdump, that means we can read the task list. And we can, once we iterate over those, since we've added support for adding new threads and adding register caches, then we can map the Linux tasks to GDB threads. And it's really the only architecture-specific code in Crash Python at all so far. Uh, that's probably more an artifact of I don't do a lot of art, 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 yeah, architecture-specific stuff. Um, it's real little. It's just basically interpreting uh, the stack frame and shoving the registers into the top of uh, GDB's idea of a stack frame. Um, so now that we have all that, then you can pick uh, a GDB thread, and th the numbers don't match up, That's there's nothing I can do about that. Um, but I do have a command to select it by PID, uh, so to select it by task struct, pointer, that sort of thing. Um, but now you can just use backtrace, and you can examine stack frames, and you get uh, named variables, you get all the types, you're not digging through bt-ff uh, anymore, guessing what a data structure is, you just get it directly, because it understands all the dwarf stuff, it understands the stack. Um, it sometimes can be a little bit tricky, and I'll show you in the demo, uh, because with Dash 02, a lot of things are optimized out, um, but it's, it's better than what we have now. Um, so this is the question I get asked the most, is actually, how do you start it? <laughs> um, so the requirements for using Crash Python are a little bit bigger than the requirements using, uh, for using Crash, because you need uh, full debug info for everything. Um, the, uh, the crash setup command on L3 slave works perfectly for this, and we'll just set up everything you need for it. Um, the two, it'll accept a bunch of different directories, and it will search all of them for uh, modules, for debug info, whatever. It loads all the modules automatically, um, which is in contrast to crash when you start it up, because otherwise you don't get symbolic stack traces in modules. It just goes, ah. Um, the two options on the bottom are less interesting for anybody not working on this. Um, I have actually probably written about as much GDB C code as I have Python code at this point. And uh, like any software, it's not always perfect. So uh, I needed to have a nested GDB and getting all that set up kind of perfectly uh, is not something that's real fun to do on the command line. Uh, so these options just let you debug the underlying GDB. It'll also take a, a compressed kernel, not a BZ image, but like a, a uh, GZ and uncompress it somewhere and we'll use that directly. Uh, so these are the commands that I have as of today. Um, we have, in addition to these, um, Vlastimil wrote uh, a bunch of KMEM commands that uh, one of us needs to port to the new infrastructure. Um, I have the structure command mostly written, it just also needs to be ported to the new infrastructure. And then we're getting sort of close to what Crash can do. Right now it's really uh, a supplemental tool rather than one that can replace Crash entirely. Um, one of the uh, downsides is that it's also kind of slow compared to Crash. Um, I need to sort out why that is. It looks like it's spending a lot of time looking up symbols in GDB, um, which could be a problem in the Python code, it could be a problem in the GDB code, I don't know which. Um, these are pretty simple so far. The, the ButterFS one uh, really just converts to FS info and uh, the ButterFS specific inode. Uh, the XFS one down here does much more powerful things that I'll show in uh, the demo later, where I can iterate over internal data structures and dump the log and do all sorts of things. Um, the sys command is just what you expect it to be. It's the same as it is on, on Crash. Um, and the other ones are, are pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's help for all of this as well. Um, so now we're getting into where the real power of this is. It's not in the commands. It's the ability to create your own scripts that use the infrastructure that uh, is built up to implement the commands. Um, but also, uh, you know, th this, is where, this is why we have it, so that you can write your own scripts that 
do uh, advanced analysis tasks that would be essentially impossible in Crash. Um, these are the iterators we have now. Uh, there's some in XFS that I didn't list because you, we don't need to get into that level of detail. But it's, it's literally, these are the things that you, you want to do in Crash but can't. So you say, give me all the devices on the system and pick out this bit of it. Um, and now, the way we have to do it now is that you can filter you know, just using text tools. But now you can say, I want to see only the, the, the devices that are NVMe. A few weeks ago, Johannes Termschen uh, saw a NVMe over fabrics bug that uh, either the, the NVMe fabric was, uh, controller was resetting or XFS was hanging or both, and we weren't really sure which, which one it was going to be. And he said, hey, can you use your tool, your tool here to just dump the state of every NVMe controller on the system or an NVMe device on the system? And that's a 10-line uh, script. It's just iterating over the block devices, uh, comparing the types, because uh, you can say look up the, uh, the FOPs for those controllers and then uh, map them. And if, if it's not either of those, then you know it's not an NVMe controller. And then just dump the structure. And it was 10 lines. And so that's something that would have been super painful to do in Crash. Um, now we're getting into a little bit more of the what you need to do to implement your own stuff. Uh, the delayed symbols are because our delayed look, uh, symbol lookups are because GDB initializes, at least on uh, x86-64, as i386, uh, which is a little bit annoying, but it also means if you have any Python code that initializes before you load the image and reset the architecture, that it thinks all pointers are four bytes, which is not particularly helpful. Uh, so what this does is it allows you to declare at the top of your class that's implementing things. I need, I'd like to use... Uh, these types, these symbols, these symbols. Uh, when you see these particular types, uh, give me a callback to do something with. Um, and I'll give you an example on the next slide. Uh, so this is, is, sorry if it's a little bit small for everybody in the back, it's, it's a lot. Um, this is the, the storage infrastructure class, it's the top of it. And so each of these are, are structures that I'm gonna need to implement everything below it. And when you have to support multiple kernel versions and the types of things can change, the members of things can change, and you don't want to do that check to see is this member present every time you do, say, a, like a loop iteration, you want to do it once and then save it because it's not like it's going to change. Uh, and so what this does is it creates class variables with well-known names. So for structures, it just drops the struct and gives you the struct name underscore type. If it's a pointer, you get struct name underscore p underscore type. Uh, for symbols, it's the same thing. You can get naming conflicts here, but you just need to be careful. And if you do get a naming conflict, you can use a, a callback to do it instead. Uh, so the types here are just give you a GDB type. The symbols uh, resolve the symbol and then give you the value associated with it, so you don't need to get the value at every call site. You just have the value available immediately. Uh, and these do the checks to make sure that uh, those symbols are what you think they are, because these are what I use uh, for filtering block device types. So I can say, give me every block device on the system, which includes all partitions as well. Uh, or I can say, give me all the disks, which uses uh, this guy to compare and say, is it a full disk or is it a partition? And only gives me the full disks. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, this does the same thing, but uh, for a type instead of a symbol. Um, <clears throat> so one of the other things that I wanted to try to do is make it easy for uh, everybody to just write scripts. And so your typical script, which I'll show in, in a little bit as well, at the top is like uh, from crash subsystem file systems import for each super block. But the thing is, in each of those, you're implementing all of this in a class so that you can have the, the fun things like the delayed lookups. Uh, and that means you'd need to instantiate it and you'd need to you know, resolve your individual implementation of it and then get the, the symbol off of that, which is kind of painful. So there's a lot of Python black, black magic under the hood that allows you to just tag a function like this that uh, exports it and it just has a singleton implementation that uh, it just instantiates automatically. And you get, this get, appears in the module namespace rather than in the class namespace, so it's just easier to use. Uh, 
this is actually uh, going to be three separate slides because it's kind of long. Uh, how to implement a basic command. Once you've come up with a certain way of doing something in Crash Python that you think would be generally useful. So like, uh, I'll show you some of the, the ButterFS commands or XFS commands later that started off as, as one-off scripts. And then you can just turn part of that into infrastructure that other people can use. And if it's really useful in a generic sense, then you can turn it into a command. And so this is just uh, the implementation of the sys command. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, the, you just inherit from crash command, and then most of this stuff just happens automatically. Uh, just This uses the same uh, arguments as the Python argument parser module. Uh, this just gives you your help, and then you just, when you call this guy, that registers it with the, with the rest of GDB, and now it becomes a, a top-level command. Uh, the command, this is just the implementation for, uh, for the sys command. Uh, all this stuff is in uh, the, the infrastructure stuff. It's in uh, types sys or something like that. Uh, so this part's not particularly important. Um, and then execute. So you get the args that are processed by the parser, and then you just take action on it. Um, so if it's config, then it, dump, it gives you the contents of uh, proc config.gz, just decompressed. And if it doesn't, then it gives you the, the little summary that I showed you on the previous slide. And the last thing you need to do, these aren't singletons, so you just instantiate one. It registers itself with GDB. There's already a reference to it, so there's nothing more you need to do. Lastly, uh, one thing to be careful about is that type equality testing is slow. It does a, if, if it isn't the same pointer in GDB, it does a, a deep, deep comparison. And so for something like task struct, that can be it resolves every pointer and compares everything in between. Uh, it's really heavyweight, so the best way to avoid that is to do the comparison once and then use the, the one off the symbol that you're gonna be iterating over, and then that will just be pointer equality. I don't know why it's different. If, if there was a cache in GDB, it would probably work a little bit better, but I don't know GDB internals that well. Um, before I do a demo, does anybody have any questions? Okay. I forget which one this is. Okay, so this is a demo of uh, pretty complex storage. So you can do, I'm gonna turn around here so that I can actually see what I'm typing to. So you get quite a few file systems on, on this system. Uh, and I forget what bug report this one was. I think the storage was I hung and there was uh, requests that weren't going and I forget why it was. Um, but we can see a bunch of different things here. So uh, I don't know why this is laggy. This is weird. And so this one, there's no, the, the AIL is empty. I, the next uh, example I have is, uh, or the next demo I have actually has a, a full one. Uh, this is just a super simple command. This isn't actually in the upstream repo yet. I want to figure out what, it, what other information I want to add there. But this just tells you what, what XFS file systems are. It's the super block, the device, and the UUID of each one. Um, this is a SLES 11 dump, so there aren't any ButterFS file systems on it and I haven't done anything for ext3 yet. Um, get the typical DMESH and stuff. Uh, one thing I haven't quite figured out yet, so Crash allows you to pipe everything through, through less, which is super convenient. Uh, that's not really doable with GDB. Uh, it's internal printing stuff doesn't really lend itself to that, and I haven't figured out a good way to fix that yet. Uh, so right now I just do set height equals zero so you don't get the GDB internal more every 25 lines or so. Um, that takes some getting used to. Um, but lastly, um, 
Let's see here. So this is the script that, I, that I'm about to demo. Um, this is just, the, the top from future stuff is just boilerplate, so it works uh, both on Python 2 and Python 3. Uh, this is the generic imports that you need for each one just to grab your helpers. Uh, this is getting the address of the flush and or the value for the flush and IO callback, um, which I use further down. And this will this loop will iterate over every disk and dump every request in each queue, and uh, it will actually tell you. Uh, what it is. And so you could see in, in the dump before, uh, I, I can't actually list all the devices yet, but there are actually more than what's in that list because the system has uh, multipath with a linear device mapper on top of it and then file systems on top of that. So in crash, that means you're following pointer after pointer after pointer, resolving uh, void pointers into you know the whatever type you need, having to figure out what file system you're getting into or what uh, block device is stacked on top of which one. And so all this stuff ends up being automated. And so at each level, it's decoding the end IO, uh, getting what the B private is for it, and then going up the next step. So when you have a decoder and you know it's just mapping something to something else, you can provide uh, the next step. And it doesn't need to be another bio. It can be a buffer head like it is at, uh, the, near the bottom of the screen. Uh, it, can be, it can start as a request and then you just grab the bio off the request and start just going up the chain. And it'll, just, it'll dump this for every request in the system. And on this system there's a lot, so I'm not gonna just uh, make you sit through the entire thing. Um, but you can see that uh, it's getting direct I.O. for XFS, it's getting ex, uh, direct I.O. for EXT3 a little bit further up. Um, I don't print the type of the device mapper device yet, though I could. Um, and these are the sort of things that just sort of evolve over time. Um, in this particular case, uh, well, for, the, for each line, uh, the decoder formats uh, what it is. And you can see in the, the loop here, we're getting an entry for each one. And so the, the only thing that's required to do a bio or a, a bio decoder sort of thing is to provide a description that the caller can print. But if you wanted to, and, and most of them do, uh, you can actually return more information. You can return the bio, you, you can return the file system type, you, you can do anything you want really. It's a dictionary, you can fill in any keys you want and return any information you want. That one's going to take a minute to load, so I'll just go to the next one. Um, so this is uh, recent support is for Sleeve, uh, Sleeve 15, uh, which uses KS, KASLR, uh, so it didn't work for a while. Uh, the missing load average is a good example of something that doesn't work right now. Um, but I can do at least uh, the symbolic debugging stuff. It didn't like that I resized. Uh, so those are all just gonna be sleeping. That one could be interesting though. And so you can see you get the, the symbolic backtrace. Uh, if we want to do frame four. And so you get the, the full symbolic debugging just like you would for user space programs that we've been missing forever. Um, and you can follow uh, pointers just like you want to.
and it works just like GDB does. There's some weirdness in here with uh, the symbol table. Uh, I don't know how to override it so that that doesn't just pick whatever symbols at zero. It really depends on uh, what's in your symbol table, what that says there. I wish I could remap it to just be null, but I don't know how to do that yet. Maybe Tom can help me with that. Um, so this file system, so this doesn't have as many file systems. This was a bug from a few years ago where uh, the there was a big XFS file system that would just grind to a crawl. And as soon as they stopped their workload, uh, it would start to recover, but it still took like three hours to recover. And it took a while to figure out why that is. This, this machine has 22,000 tasks running on it. Uh, so going through all of the stack traces is painful. Um, and trying to figure out what's doing what. Obviously there's a lot of duplicate stack traces, but uh, when you're trying to figure out what's getting locked and you're talking deep into the file system internals and you don't know what inodes are locked and buffers are locked, then you actually need to go and examine each one. Um, so in this particular case, uh, let's see. I ended up writing this kind of a mess of a script. There's, uh, this is what I mean by when you just, you're creating little one-offs. So you have, uh, and this is a little bit laggy, like hard-coded addresses in there. Uh, so this script will only work on this crash dump. Um, and, and these are addresses that I dug out of uh, classic crash. Uh, this is uh, printing the paths for each inode, uh, determining whether a read-write sem is locked or not. Um, going through the XFS item type uh, to determine if it's an inode that's locked in the log or a buffer or uh, you know how many things are waiting on it. Um, and then we go and uh, now this, this actually I can do, um, this part of it I can do as a command. That's the dump AAL command that I'll show in a minute. Um, but the really powerful part comes in. So this is, this is keeping track and, and populating a dictionary of all the inodes and buffers it finds. And then this is something we absolutely can't do on Crash, which is iterate over the, every stack for every task in the system, look at each frame, see if you can find certain symbols on the stack, and then since you can look up uh, arguments and local variables by name, you can pull them out. And so what this, this script ends up doing is cross-referencing uh, all the inodes that are in the logs are in the log, all the buffers that are in the log with the stacks of everything on uh, every task on the system. So you can see if the log is waiting for like a, some task to release the inode lock or something like that. Um, and ultimately in this case, what ended up happening is that uh, there were, the, the log was stuck, I think, because uh, so many things were hammering on the allocation, uh, there were only four allocation groups for this 50 core system, and they were all hammering in the same allocation group and nothing could make any progress. Uh, which, unfortunately for them, meant there was no bug fix. It means they have to reformat their file system with more allocation groups. Um, but we were able to give them an answer fairly quickly that this was your issue. Um, and in classic crash, this would have taken weeks. Um, let's see. And so this dumps what's in the XFS uh, journal effectively. So you can see the status of, uh, well, where the, what inodes are in there, the status of the buffers, if they're locked, whatever. Um, this is one of those cases where uh, it uses iterators in uh, the file system uh, subsystem infrastructure. Uh, and so you can iterate over everything on, in the AIL without having to run this command. You don't need to do any post-processing on the output. You don't need to go and hack on something. You can use the iterator directly to get the information you want out of it. All right, and 
This is the last demo I have, which shows <laughs> how things break sometimes. Um, this is using uh, the 4.18 uh, kernel with some ButterFS patches on it. Um, it's not doing anything special. I just uh, booted the system and then uh, triggered a crash dump directly. Uh, this is me debugging VFS mount stuff. Um, you can find something that's stuck. And so I haven't had a chance to debug this yet, but the stack trace for whatever, re whatever reason ends in uh, down right, and I don't know why. Um, so I'm going to get to it eventually, but this is how things can break in a semantic debugger where it's not always obvious. Um, eventually I'd like to come up with some test cases that just have a bunch of uh, crash dumps just to uh, uh, like test against so that we are sure we get the same results out of them. And then we can do, like if I can come up with a, a standard way to crash the system so that it's a, something easy to debug um, to make sure that everything works. Um, but that's all I have for the demo. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, Alish. The, the GDB stuff? Uh, yeah, I was talking with Tom earlier today, or yesterday, about doing exactly that. Um, I need to get some, uh, <laughs> find where my test cases went. Um, but otherwise, uh, we're going to try to get started on that. Uh, the feedback that I got when I tried before was that things like uh, section names uh, are considered internal and they don't want to export them. Um, so if we don't actually need that, that might not matter. Um, otherwise, I think it should be pretty reasonable. I mean, we have a pretty obvious use case for it. Um, so it's just a discussion that needs to be had. Are you looking for contributors? And if so, what kind of um, contributions are you looking for? So the question was if I'm looking for contributors and if uh, what kind of contrib contributions I'm looking for. Yes, um, this is on GitHub, uh, so you can just go look at it. Um, I don't think I have a slide that actually has the GitHub URL on it this time, um, which was silly of me. Um, contributions, uh, it depends on what you're looking to do. Uh, I'll take most stuff, I guess, as long as it, it fits into the, the way I'm looking to do it. Um, there is a contrib directory uh, that I'll take pretty much anything. Um, that That's mostly intended for people who write scripts to solve a particular problem and just want to share how they did it so that other people can get ideas. Um, mostly I'm looking to build out infrastructure. Um, obviously as the, the file systems team lead, most of the stuff that I've been doing is focused on that area. Um, but there's no reason it can't be generally useful. Um, so if, if people are working in other subsystems and think they can extend it, like I know, like Vlastimil's KMEM stuff, for example, um, I'd be absolutely interested in stuff like that. Anything that makes it more useful for more people. So are you looking to make it um, more equivalent to Crash as far as, are you looking at? Are you, look, are you looking to make it more feature equivalent to Crash as far as the commands available? Eventually, yes. This is getting weird. <laughs> yeah, so right now I've been focusing on the areas where it, it can differentiate um, because we still have Crash as a tool to use, so I don't need to replace it outright. Um, but eventually, yes, I'd like to come up with implement the, the feature set that Crash has so that it could replace it. I'm not sure it ever will though, because uh, as you can see, it's not exactly fast. Um, so for certain tasks, I think Crash is still going to be a useful tool, um, unless I can figure out what's making it slow. Um, I don't necessarily think just Python overhead is the reason it's being slow. I think there might be some other issues that need to be worked out. Um, but if, if it can be as fast as Crash and we implement the same feature set, then yeah, it could replace it. Because this seems like it has more potential for scriptability and automating tasks than Crash does. Absolutely. And there's uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that um, 
even though all my demos were interactive, there's no reason that they have to be. Uh, so you can write scripts that, that use Crash Python and like say you, you're, you have it run automatically and you, the last part of your script is just sys exit. So you just give it a core dump and have it, uh, it dump a report. And there's no reason we can't do that. It's all, it's all in there. So we could have something like a support config that analyzes core dumps and just, if we, if we can do it in a generic way, it could be pretty powerful. That's exactly what I was thinking because I think that would be very useful for L2. Sure. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, thanks for coming in and thanks for your, uh, your attention.